So Shreya, hi. First, let me thank you for coming and playing here. When we spoke about doing something here and had the idea and actually shot it, we didn't have a name for this, but we decided to call it Artlib. So you guys are officially the first people to come and play here. So I'm super happy that the both of you did. So thanks to you and of course Praveen, who's waving there from behind the camera. <laughs> Um, yeah, so this is just a casual conversation on just art and of course surrounding um, what you guys actually played here. So um, when you actually have to come up with say something that you do as an instrumental piece, how do you begin to approach it or how do you begin to think about it when it's not necessarily compositional or performative in nature? Mm. Hi Ritwik. <laughs> It's great to be here and we're so happy we got to play the first edition of what I'm sure is going to be an absolutely lovely series. Thank you. Um, to answer your question, how do you go about it now? Uh, it's actually very, very nice to work with a blank canvas, whether that is for a performance or for a, a shoot like this. or So actually, I don't have a certain uh, or a route or a map Marie Kadea, the first let's fix this, then mm. let's go here. So it depends upon, in this case, it's really the vibe that I think we got from you when you uh, spoke to us and like what you want to uh, share with the audience through the series itself. Yeah. It's one thing to share through the particular piece of art, it's one thing to share through the overall intent of the series and I think that just led us to what we'd like to do. And then, of course, like physical parameters, logistic parameters come into it. Is it a shoot? Is it live? Is it yeah. produced? Yeah. Is it live? Is it um, a longer duration, shorter duration? So those things ha yeah. happen. But essentially, what is the series trying to do and what can we do through it? Yeah. No, but honestly, when you guys asked me if it was going to be live, I actually like the idea of, say, 10 or 15 people being crammed in here and having a limited audience mm -hmm. and seeing how that feels like as well. So that's maybe something that we should... Um, think of doing down the road too. Absolutely. But coming to what you played, you, I mean, uh, I guess by the time the poster is out, people will know that it's a medley of Tilanas. So when I think of a Tilana or what a Tilana means to me, I have a certain parameter of what works for me, for my voice, etc. Because I think of it from, say, the vocal perspective of singing a Tilana. But does that change the choice when you have to think about it from the sound of the violin? And of course, for you, for having learned from a maestro who is probably a modern day genius of composing Tilanas and finding his own way of doing it, how does disconnecting from that and looking at Tilanas outside of his Tilana construct also work in putting together a medley like this? I absolutely do not think about what Tilana works for the sound of the violin at all. Hmm. Uh, I, whatever the melody is, and that is not just Tilanas, it can be any kind of composition, it can be any genre for that matter. When I hear a melody, what I immediately think of is, how will this sound through the violin? Or how can I interpret this through the sound of the violin? Right. What happens when that composition passes through the violin? What is literally what comes out of the F hole? I actually picture the song going into the violin and coming out of the f hole like that. So uh, I believe that whatever it is, there it has a certain voice, it has a certain sound and an identity of its own when it comes through that instrument. Yeah. And you shouldn't be afraid to um, zoom in to the max when you learn it and zoom out to the max when you want to interpret it. Okay. Keeping in mind that you have to be absolutely committed to the vision of the composer, to the best of your understanding and intent, of course, and ability and all of that. But yeah, to, to your best uh, either, you should be true to you know what the spirit of the composition is, if you know the spirit of the composer, the intent of the composer. But within that, don't be afraid to interpret. Um, so that's what it is. And to that point, actually thinking of what sounds good for the voice, what sounds good for the violin or anything else, one of the Tilanas in this medley is going to be Palamurli Sirs. And he made a Tilana that, will never be said it's a vocal tillana, right? Yeah, no, no, for extremely sure. instrumental, yeah. quote unquote. And he, he's a singer and he sang it and he sang it with so much flair. So actually I would take cues from, you know, it's been done, said and done. And all we need to do is look for it and not be afraid to go down that path. Lovely. Um, the second part of the question about um, being so intrinsically within the learning process or sometimes even the compositional 
process of a maestro like lalgudi sir how how has that insight allowed due to maybe reassess some of the other telanas that you play and how did you go about choosing certain telanas and what fell one after the other when i was learning um hardcore you know that period where it, i was continuously learning from him in a very hardcore way there were no other telanas in my radar mm. telana meant lalgudi sir telanas and at that point there was no reason to even say lalgudi sir because sir is only sir so mm-hmm. says sir telanas uh, and varnams by the way mm. um but and or or shri ragavarnam viriboni varnam in the level kuda vera endha tilana o radar le kadaya tilana was 100% lalgudi sir tilana right. um but of course with a more um, learning exposure with more performance exposure with more listening exposure you come to find that there are you know there's always a world outside your world no matter what your yeah. world is to begin with right and um, for this particular medley that way i was very very happy to zoom out one thing i specifically didn't want to do was uh, stay within my uh, comfort zone or my it's home for me it's not just comfort that's great zone. because i'll tell you i when i think not sure you or praveen mentioned to me that you guys are thinking of doing a tilana medley i automatically assumed it was going to be a lalgudi tilana medley <laughs> right because that's also my um baggage of what i think you may be playing which is also something that we all subconsciously carry in so many different ways no we all come from our learning heritage and we also yeah. tend to display the same share the same and then share it on to the next generation and there's nothing wrong with that it's yeah. a beautiful tradition but in this case i really wanted to see because at this point i'm fortunate enough to have had exposure to other kinds of tilanas as well and it's fascinating to me how different composers have approached the same concept but in a very different way because yeah. tilana by itself is avlo not subject to interpretation as its form it's it's got a very urumadri mm. generally recognized format mm. generally recognized position in the concert for a dance concert for a music concert mm. and um and yet there are so many different approaches to tilana so my guru's approach is what i have grown up you know identifying as an and then when i heard for example the andhavar vithilana it was a world you know of difference and it's really fascinating that way to say idon tilana idon tilana idon tilana and how they can all come together uh, with sounding both different and cohesive at the same time beautiful and i remember right after we finished the shoot i just uh, transferred all the videos and audio and we were listening to it and i remember the both of you vibing and jiving to your own music which is when i think there was a lot of conversation happening when the two of you decided that you'll also maybe see how post recording layers i mean we mm-hmm. talk about pre recorded layers but post recording and adding a certain production value to something that you performed live see if that can take an entirely different form so i think that is very interesting in a carnatic space because that is not something that i have done myself i have only worked with pre recorded layers but to take a live performance and add to it after that is i think is a very interesting thing to look at and explore so i'll i'm going to switch over to praveen to speak about that and then and then go into what he felt about um doing this as well awesome so praveen and tell me a little bit more about the post production aspect of this what went into making the piece that it finally is okay so the technical term is definitely post production but i think see the way we consume carnatic music now is very different a lot of people consume carnatic music through a computer or right. they play carnatic music in a car earlier carnatic music happened in a concert if we were to say the same that's experience. almost like you're saying that there aren't as many concerts happening i mean i'm just joking but it's no. but it's actually interesting to see yeah. that divergence so of thought so yeah. it is natural for the art form to kind of change or like adapt to what's happening now because right. you can't stop the world from consuming the way they are consuming music now in fact even the idea of buying music online has stopped Changed. it's about streaming music now yeah so i feel that this is not even post production i i i feel that this is part of production this is mm. part of ideation so uh, if you really think of i'm i mean like i'm deeply fascinated by musical arrangement and music production these two things really excite me and as a carnatic musician this art form again really excites me mm. so my thing is to really 
what I see as the core aspects of this art form to retain that, but to definitely also dwell into concepts of music production and music arrangement. That can even be for playing for a song. Yeah. Uh, I see that every stroke that I have in my instrument as an asset and not just like, yeah. you know, go. that's exactly how we, we were thinking about this. Uh, so when we play, there's already like a few things that I can imagine because of the skill set that I have. So I would say like, kind of a, we keep talking about this old sound or nostalgia and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And uh, music can goes in different directions, right? So you have the idea of a uh, lot of mathematics happening in Korve or uh, you do Grahabedam and Ragam. These are all ideas that kind of excite you and take you in a direction. And I really think it's high time sound should excite us too. Absolutely. Because that's the fundamental expression of this art form. Beautiful. Sound is the most mm. fundamental thing. And this should also be part of all other explorations that are already exciting in this art form. Which is why, you know, when we recorded, it's like, let's get the retro sound. Let's get maybe a clean sound. Mm. Let's, let's get a big sound. Let's get a church sound. Mm. All of this, again, since we have gone to these places... We have heard old recordings, we have uh, heard clean recordings, we've yep. heard comforting recordings. So I just thought like that should be a part of ex part of experience too because those also trigger a lot of things in your brain. Lovely. Something that you said in between, um, I want to take off from that. You said this has to almost become part of ideation as well. But given this particular production, you guys had an idea of what to do as a live piece of say 12 to 14 or 15 minutes or however long. So how is it to retrospectively ideate without, um, what do I say, it affecting the flow of what the live performance was? How do you approach something like that when you deciding to add layers was not part of the plan when you actually played it live? Right. So this is like how the, the classical question of did the lyric evolve first or the tune evolve first, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes it's, you just hear the word and then you compose a song based on that. Sometimes it's a tune and then you try to fit in a word. So sometimes you just play. When we were playing, I, I could hear sections of, you know, these spaces more than anything else. So I just thought, why not? We have the technology. And moreover, I think we are using technology in a very safe way in Carnatic music. As of now, it's great. We have a clean sound. But I really feel... Uh, the scope of what we can do with sound is much more than what we're doing currently. What we're exploring. Right? Uh, and I mean, like, it's just a fascinating exploration. Lovely. And not everyone has to do this or the, you know, the the scene doesn't have to change. But yeah. there can be an offshoot of, you know, someone trying to do something where you still have the Carnatic aspect. It's not fusion music. You're not trying to bring in blues and jazz and fuse it so that you get a different experience. But you really tap into different uh, spaces and different memories. In fact, these are all memories. Like according yeah. to me, I see these, as, these things are, as memories. So, yeah. Okay, great. So I'm just going to ask you um, something else and continuing on that. So is it safe to then assume that um, as much as you heard or saw these visual sonic spaces while you were performing live, when you actually added these layers after, you were still somehow in the moment and just reacting to what happened like. So in a sense, it's not actually composed or it's not in a way um, consciously complementing it, but just an added layer of reaction, but not in the moment, but maybe after the moment. Is that a, is that a fair way to maybe think of it? You could think of it that way, but now the way I'm thinking of even performing live is, like I said, musical arrangement because each element mm. is something that you can play with and you could go blast like you can just blast from right. the beginning that is also a great vibe to set or you could just build something or you cannot be or you there are so many things that you can do live is what i'm starting to see at least with my own instrument and what i can do with my instrument and especially with other musicians and you see that as a possibility within the carnatic show absolutely and without I'm not even sometimes changing the phraseology, but the context in which that phrase happens. Mm -hmm. And this Very is going to take time. This is going to take maybe, because it's it's not something new, but it's kind of a newish experience because of the context. Very interesting. Okay. Okay. So now I have just maybe a couple of questions for the both of you together. So I'm just going to move out and ask you to switch with me. Okay. So... 
Okay, I don't want to come across this as a cliche question, right? Because I'm married to another artist as well. But when you come up with a piece like this, I know more often than not that it can be brutally excruciating to find and navigate all of the disagreements that normally happen artistically because we normally tend to be more brutally honest with each other because we also share a relationship outside of art. So how do you guys normally navigate that? And you guys work together in a lot of other um, bands as well that you uh, play along with. So I'm just curious to get a peek into that. <laughs> it's definitely a very interesting process. That much I can tell you guys. Yeah. Um... Let me put it this way, very, very short answer would be, we definitely get to see the best of each other as artists and collaborators that perhaps others don't, either when they work with us or when we work with them. We also get to see the absolute worst of each other as, I don't mean as people or as a couple, I mean as artists and collaborators that others definitely don't see when we work with them because there's a bare minimum that we will not cross. Of course, that's privilege. And uh, I don't know if that is privilege or abuse of privilege, actually. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's something that we have actually very consciously tried to figure out where we can maximize that extra best, honestly, we get only with each other. Where we can actually maximize more and more of that. But right now, it's like, like, like there's, I think there's a uh, Melvin Monroe quote, you don't deserve the best of me if you can't deal with the worst of me kind of quote. But we are trying to minimize the <laughs> yeah minimize the the whatever you know uh, to because bottom line when we work we just work there's actually no uh, there's no couple there's no marriage there's no there's no uh, running the house uh, no, when we sit together and work nobody talks about food or fridge or pick up drop nothing when we work we we block time when we enter the workspace we are only there to work. And that actually helps a little bit in terms of what our expectations are of, of ourselves and of each other so that everybody's very clear as to what goes and what doesn't. But of course, easier said than done. Yeah. I mean, like, like I said, we both are also strong that way. We have our own views and we also want to kind of have a version of that because uh, that kind of has defined you for such a long time. Yeah. But you also want to change because this, you know, you it's all grey. And that's the interesting part that we are still figuring out. And I think it's work in progress. It's going to be work in progress. Yeah. And uh, I, I would say, though, that we have kind of minimized. If someone wants to disagree, I know how we know how to disagree better now. That I think that's yeah. something that we have kind of figured out is what I would say. We still disagree and I think that's a really, it's really important, important part of this uh, process. One danger of this, you know, where you live together, work together and spend almost every second together is you tend to sometimes fuse together into one composite yeah. being. And that is not really a good thing. I think we both yeah. definitely feel that. So it's very important to learn how to be yourself what to fight for to retain that identity. At the same time, you should learn that you're not fighting the other person. Correct. You're just fighting to stay, to retain that line. And that can be a beautiful thing if you actually manage to find that line because you, you get the best of all worlds. You get the best version of me, the best version of him, and the best version of us together. Beautiful. Okay. Anything quickly that the two of you want to say about the piece just for people to know what to expect? If you want to say something. Um, it's been a really happy time doing this because um, it's not like, honestly, in the room, something that nobody has done before. We didn't even go in that direction. Uh, he told me about it. We brainstormed a few ideas. We narrowed in on one we, and then I ran with it. I had a full sketch planned out. I shared that with him. We played it a couple of times and then we just came and shot. That's pretty much in terms of process. In terms of content, um, like we spoke about Ritwik, it's, it's been really nice uh, going into the different interpretations of Tilana as a compositional form. What's also been lovely in this is we've also improvised with that form, which is not, we don't get to usually do that uh, to that extent in a concert. Um, but it was great because we got to melodically and rhythmically 
sometimes, uh, and this word I learned from Rupik Melo, rhythmically, <laughs> where like ragam is played on top of a, uh, you know, or I don't know if, if the rhythm is played on the ragam, you can interpret it how, however you want, but things like that. It was really nice to explore Tilanas in a very, very free-flowing way. And then, of course, the sound aspect, the production aspect. One really cool thing, Zoltima, or like, um, was it was really nice to improvise on something in post because uh, we didn't plan for it like that, which means nothing is on click. So it's actually not easy to add layers at all. What you hear is uh, live music, by the way. Uh, it has some elements that, you know, we kind of worked after we recorded live. Uh, one thing, one takeaway uh, from this process is the sound of Carnatic music is really powerful and the scope of what we can do with this art form is just astounding. That's my takeaway and I, I hope someone who's listening to this video feels that way and it inspires them to do something with their craft. Absolutely. Just, you can stay within the idiom and yet um, goes on to a much broader topic actually, but without fusion, and then you'll ask what is fusion. Fusion so, is also fine, by the way. And and but in this fusion. case, really, I mean, basically, at least keeping it to this product, I think the two of us, it was just a very, we stayed within what we felt was the uh, idiom of the art form, the idiom of the composition itself, even when in creating the medley and deciding what comes after what, everything. Even we, with the soundscapes, right? With the yeah. soundscapes, with everything. And the ideas that we did in post, none of the live layers were touched. Nothing was touched, touched up, edited, modified. Things were only added to it in a way, actually, Ritwik described it perfectly. It's like reacting to it, but in a deferred timeline. It's a brilliant way to put yeah. it. That's exactly what we did. Okay. I look forward to everyone listening to it, and I hope everyone enjoys it as well. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.